Well, g'day, Max here again. Welcome back to the shop. So, this episode, we're going to get the spindle bearing back in the machine with its new bearings fitted. I aim to get the whole project completed in this episode. So, last episode, we fitted the, the bearing cups into the headstock of the lathe. And I had to cut it short there because the procedure in changing the cones without creating a lot of damage um, it's a bit of mucking around and I did have to make up um, a couple of bits and pieces so we can carry this bearing change out without doing any damage to any of the components. So we'll swing you down and we'll go through our plan of attack. Now this is the bearing to be removed. So we have this plate which is part of the labyrinth seal. And that's made out of cast iron, so that's very brittle, so we have to be careful of what we're pulling, pushing, or, or, or tugging on. Now, as you can see, there's no room in there, so don't be tempted to start prying with bars on either side, because all you'll end up doing is damaging this land around here on the labyrinth seal retainer. So forget that idea. Another option... Just if you can cut the cage off, then you can use a set of bearing separators um, clamped around the inner race. And of course you have two extension studs coming up the side here. So that would be clamped around the race of the bearing on the lip. You'd have two extension studs coming up to a crossbar. It'd be a crossbar on the top with a, your puller on the top and you can pull it off that way. That's not really the wisest way. Due to getting the cage broken off down here, you're going to risk damaging the, this lip as well. So the method that we're going to use We're going to go through these holes. Well, before we go there, now because we're going to use this, um, use our plate to help push the bearing off. What you do not want to do is put it in the press and start pushing, like support it under the plate there, and start pressing the spindle, because you do not know exactly what's going on inside that plate, cast iron being brittle, it may work, it may crack the plate, then you're up shit creek, you've got to get a, well, you're going to have to make another plate. So we want to be pushing through this plate as close to the, the um, bearing cone diameter as possible. Now the only way to do that So I can get you set up a bit better here. We have our three holes here. Now these are for the cam lock and they go through to the inside lip on this plate. So if I push there, you see it pushes the plate and in turn the plate pushes the bearing. So what I've got, I've got these three step punches or three step drifts made up. They go in there and push on the plate at a close equal diameter to the race on the bearing cone. So we're not pushing on the outside of this or anything like that. This is being, the cast iron on here is being used purely as a spacer, so there's no levering going on. Now the reason these punches are, are stepped, your lathe might be different, but it's to clear, uh, there's a little shoulder inside the bores. So there's, we use three of these punches. 
and we push down on all three at the same time. So we'll get this set up in the press and we'll show you how it works. Okay, so we have our three pins coming down, pushing on this plate, which is pushing on the bearing, and then a pusher plate, so it pushes on all three pins at the same time. So then we've just got to See our pins coming through now. Okay, there's our unharmed spindle, our unharmed plate. And our unharmed bearing. With all of our spindle parts all cleaned up, um, we've already cut out a new gasket for the uh, labyrinth seal retainer and bearing retainer. So that slips over that. We'll get our we've got our bearing ready to go. So we'll just give that a little bit of warmth in the toaster oven and just a drop of oil around the bearing journal where it's going to press on. So the idea is heating the bearing up in the toaster oven. We don't really want to go over 100 degrees 100 degrees C and then we'll slip the bearing on now the bearing will either drop all the way on down to its seat that'll be nice or it'll go halfway on and grab that either way it doesn't matter it's not going to affect us halfway down and grabs fine as uh, you'll see in the next step to follow so I'll give that five minutes and then we'll come back by then the bearing would have warmed up enough and expanded to get a good start over its seat. Righty ho. That's only still about 88. We'll leave it at that. It's 88, 90 degrees. I'm happy with that. We'll slip him on. Main thing is you don't you don't rush. The bearing's not going to cool down in a hurry. Have a sleeve ready. Just keep a bit of pressure on. If you don't keep the pressure on, they can lift up off their seat just a fraction. 
It's the same as if you're using uh, liquid nitrogen to, to shrink down a bearing cup when you put it in a housing. You still have to give it a tap down to make sure when it's expanded back out that the bearing cup is still seated. That feels seated to me. And of course, oh, this is just a piece of scrap. I have turned the edge down so it fits inside and hits on the inner race. If it grabs, if the bearing grabs halfway on, no dramas. All you do is put it on, the ring on, put it in a press and press it home. Okay. Let's get a bit of oil on it before we forget. So what we'll do now is we'll cover that over and when it cools down to room temperature we will install it into the machine. That's that other circlip sitting in its groove and that's the one I know a couple of years mentioned that I might have forgot to slip it into its groove but no I did that when I was checking the detents on the levers. So with your two levers for your speed selectors they can get a bit, a bit, well, how should I put it, slack, <laughs> um, not positive anymore. Um, there isn't, a, if you pull off, they have these cheesy stick-on badges. If you pull them off, inside is an Allen key. So you can just adjust the tension accordingly. It's just a spring and a ball, spring and a little plunger and just give them a little bit more tension because they do wear after time just to get a bit more of a positive feel to them. So I'm, I don't know, I'm not going to put these back on. I might drill and tap a little thread in each shaft and make a little brass one to, with a little screw in the middle. It looks a bit more professional than these things. So. Yeah, right, let's see if we can't get this spindle sitting in position. So we've cut out a new gasket uh, for the front plate and I've already given it a coating of grease as I prefer to do with the majority of my gaskets. Depends on the application of course. So the gasket's on. A bit more oil around the bearing, just a very light, little light, light coating, light coating on the cups. Okay, so we'll into the spindle, into the hole, and get our first gear ready, which will be. This large one here. Let me just go refer to the parts manual to make sure I get this in the, the right way around as it has a, uh, a boss on one side. Oh hang on you want to see my lathe not the bloody calendar. Hang on let me turn you around. That's better sometimes the, the uh, iPad I used to film on starts filming from the opposite way. Okay, so we've had a look in the parts breakdown and this gear goes in this way around. So, and just chuck a bit of oil on the journals on the spindle just to the greasier the easier. Very carefully assemble our gears in the correct order. So we have another gear to go on. And then we have a circlet. And the 
last gear, the final gear. Which goes that way. It's just a matter of now line up the keyways so I can slip the shaft in. Another key way to go in. Okay. Now we've got to slip our circlip back down a bit. stays on the selector. Make sure we've got this in the right order. So we've got, yeah, no, it looks right. on this last gear is that way just slip that keyway out temporarily slide our circlip along fish up our keyway that we just dropped Set it there so we don't lose it. Okay, come in a bit further. They come out a lot easier than what they go in.
just about there. Okay, we'll slip our circlip along a bit further. Okay, put our other keyway in now. Okay, that's in. Now, there's a selector down here for the uh, direction of the feeds. Now, the selector is offset. Now, I'm just going to have to find out which way it's supposed to be offset. I could have it 180 degrees out. So let me just go and refer to the uh, parts breakdown. Okay, yeah, I just had to rotate the brass selector. I'll we'll bring it down and have a look. Yeah, this little bronze selector here, it's offset one way so it fits into this groove properly. If it's the other way around, the gear um, ends up too far towards the end of the headstock. So we just had to make sure we got, got that right. So everything's approximately in position. Uh, this gear just has to go up, hard up against this gear and then we can install our circlip which the groove is uh, just here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to support the nose of the uh, spindle with the tailstock and that will hold everything in line. So just using the pipe centre I'll get everything um, lined up so we have to get this front plate lined up in position that goes approximately there. So I'll just wind in the tail stock just gently while I sort of get this other selector back in its spot, which it fell out. Okay, that sounds. Just tap this other gear forward. Okay, he's home. A bit more pressure on the tailstock. A bit more tap tap on the gear.
Okay, we're there. Okay, let's spin you around to a different location and we'll get the last remaining circlip in place. But So we have this labyrinth seal casing to bolt back up and everything's held square in place up against the bearing by the pipe center. So when we go to install our rear bearing, the shaft's held rigidly in place, it's not wobbling around. We're not going to damage the bearing putting it in, the bearing will go straight into position. So let's get this last circlip here, which has to go into a groove here. We'll get that all set up first. We can just use our normal pliers for this. The ratcheting ones are good for keeping the circlip um, open while it's you know assembling and disassembling as it frees up a set of hands. And he's in position. Everything's turning nicely. Beautiful. Okay. So let me get this, what we'll do here, we'll get this um, labyrinth housing screwed up first and then we'll get our rear bearing in. So it's just the three cap screws. Okay, put a nip on those. Everything still turns nice and free. Okay, so we can install our rear bearing now and do the bearing preload. Okay, we've had our bearing in the toasted sandwich maker warming up. Let's just see if we can get it started over here. That's it. She's home. Bit of oil. And pop the adjusting nut off, nut off, uh, nut on and just nip it up. I just want it very lightly nipped, that's all I want. So we can back our tail stock off now. Now I can tell now we've got some end float happening now, so we can take a bit of that up.
clips. Just have the slightest bit of end float going on there. So I just give this nut one little nip. Just getting there. What I'm going to do is let that cool off now, back to room temperature, and then we can do our final adjustment. So yeah, there's a bit of heat come through into the spindle now. So that'll give us um, a bit of a false feel as regards to adjustment, how adjustment goes. So we'll let it cool down the room temperature and do our final. Um, preload adjustment. Our spindle's cooled down to room temperature now. So now I've never seen any set method or specification how to set your bearing up on your spindle for this model lathe. So I'll show you how I am going to do it. First off we just mount an indicator on the face. And then we've got to come around to the rear and see what these rollers are doing. So let's see if I can find a spot to sit the camera. Because this is actually quite important, this part. Okay, when I turn the spindle slowly, you can see how those rollers are turning. Now we're looking at the 12 o'clock position. Now if we come around... to the side we can see they're only just sort of turning so we'll come to the opposite side Okay, see that one opposite the slot? See that around there? See they're not turning? We'll come down underneath to the 6 o'clock position. See they're sort of turning but they're skipping as well. So that means we do not have enough preload on these bearings. So we'll come back around to the front. So there's a little flicker of the needle there. We can grab the spindle rocket backwards and forwards nothing's happening so you can be fooled into thinking you've got zero end play there which is incorrect so now if I push on the spindle see the needle goes back to zero and I'll push from the rear of the machine to push the spindle forward while rocking it and see we're coming up to four thou We'll go back the other way. 
Okay, we've got four thousandths of an inch and float. Now, generally, uh, with taper roller bearings of around this size and, and smaller and bigger, that's a pretty normal range to be in if it was in a transmission. But this is in a headstock, so it's not acceptable. So we have to bring that to zero. Okay, so we'll, what we have to do then is nip up the nut on the rear a, a bit more. And we have to reduce this to zip. So that flicker of the needle from between zero and four comes out. And at the same time, all those rollers that we looked at on the rear will all be rotating. So what we're aiming for is, is a virtually is a zero end float and just a, a, a tiny minuscule of preload. So we'll go around the back again and we'll nip this nut up. So I'm going to put a mark here with a sharpie. Just as a reference, in case we go too far and have to slacken it off again and go again. So we'll just give this, I'll put it in low, uh, a low gear. We'll just tap this around a little bit at a time. So with each tap, we do an inspection of the rollers. So same again, I can see some of these rollers are not turning. So that means another tap. Be tapping on the opposite side to the last side that I tapped. Okay, back in the neutral. Same again. We'll do it again, there's still some rolls not, not rotating. Okay, they're all rotating now. So I'm just going to put a mark, make sure we use this mark here, we'll put that mark to 12 o'clock. I'm just going to give the spindle a good spin by hand. I'm looking to see how far it goes. We're we going one turn or two turns. We're aiming for one revolution. which we're coming up pretty close to there. That's one revolution. Freewheeling in neutral. Okay, so we'll go back to our dial indicator on the front. So I'm going to push the spindle towards the camera and rock it. So we're not getting any advancement there, so I'm going to push it back the other way. So 
So between pulling it and pushing it, we're getting approximately two tenths, two to three tenths. Which is two to three tenths too much. Now I'm going to give this adjusting nut one more tap. Zero this indicator. <coughs> it's a one thou graduation indicator. <coughs> it it doesn't matter what indicator you use, metric, imperial, it could have one inch graduations. Or we, we just we do not want that indicator to deviate off the, the off the solid line. And we can easily estimate we're in the vicinity of, of about, I'd say about one and a half tenths. And I can feel the spindle has tightened up. So we'll go for our um, one rotation test again. And we're getting, looks like two thirds of a turn there. Three quarters of a turn there. Three quarters of a turn there. I can feel a slight drag on that now. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, I'll, I'll nip up the lock screws at the back, and we're going to run the spindle. And what we need to do is recheck this at operating temperature. So we go through the same procedure again once it's at operating temperature because we do not know how far the spindle is going to expand when it, when it gets a bit of warmth into it. Um, the more it expands the more preload comes off the bearings and the looser the spindle will get. Uh, the spindle will move more than what the housing, the cast iron headstock housing will move. That won't, I doubt that would move anything. It, you may get a you may even get a thou of ex half a thou of expansion um, with the spindle, which that, that's where your preload your, starts dropping off. So what we're aiming for when the machine is warm is a one full re revolution, spinning with the finger, with nothing, no movement that we can detect. Um, on the indicator axial movement in and out. So let's button up the rest of the machine and then we'll put some oil in it and run it up. A little bit of pipe sealant on the plug. So we have a, we're going to put a heap more of those super strong real earth magnets in the headstock. Now a good source of supply for this sort of thing is Things like 
remote mount UHF aerial bases and uh, mag base um, revolving lights you see on some machines They're, you know that are been thrown away they're always a good source to acquire these magnets from so we'll put all of these in the headstock and that will help catch any future metallic particulates that might be floating around so we have an array of magnets in place and there's a whole heap more of them down the bottom scattered around in various locations so they should stop any metal fragments from coming along these oil ways and going down towards the uh, headstock bearings so our lids ready to go on now normally they just put a, a bead of celastic around uh, between the headstock casting and the lid I hate celastic so I've cut out a gasket and of course smeared both sides of the gasket with grease and this way we can take the lid on and off at leisure to do an inspection and we're not dicking around scraping celastic and with the grease on the gasket it stops the gasket sticking so let's get this lid on the oil in and then we'll fire it up okay we're on slow pulley so we're on low uh, one so 170 rpm we'll just give it a run for a while at this speed This uh, 70 RPM. It's 300, this will be 420. And 650. Well, that's quiet. That's a uh, speed I use quite a lot. No, that's a hell of a lot less um, noise and carry on than what was happening before. So I think we'll run it on uh, 420 for a while. Just let it warm up. So you can sit there like that for an hour. And then we'll bring you back. Well this has been running for a couple of hours now, so the average of the temperatures around the headstock casting it varies, uh, you get down the bottom here, which will be a bit cooler because it's next to the bed, we're about 30, 37 degrees, come halfway up, 43, 40, a solid 43 degrees C. Um, our labyrinth seal ring, which is closest to the bearings, running at 45. 
the um, end of the spindles. 29 degrees, 30 degrees, that's where the cam lock um, area is. Come to the other labyrinth seal part, 45 degrees, so back to the main casting, 42, drops off to 38. So yeah, in the, the labyrinth seal areas, which are uh, the closest really to the bearings, you're only what five degrees warmer than the main casting. Well, that's not that far out there. The actual spindle probably won't get a good yeah. But if I measure inside, I get a better temperature. The bats have been running about forty degrees. Let's pop this chuck off and uh, see if I can get a, a measurement uh, a bit closer to the bearing area. Oh, while well, we've got the chuck on. Let's do a spin test. That's coming up about one and three quarter turns, so it could be tightened up a little bit more. Remember one turn with the chuck on, it's um, a pretty good spot to be in. That's what it was when we did, before we disassembled it when we checked it. I'm just going to knock her out of gear. Yeah, opposite the bearing, we're looking at about 40 degrees. 40, 42 degrees. Yeah, 45 on the uh, labyrinth seal rings. So, I've got another indicator here. It's a ten thousandths of an inch graduated indicator. So we'll check our um, spindle end flow. So we've got four ten thousandths of an inch um, spindle end float, so I'll bring you over to have a look. Okay, we're pretty well on zero there. So each division is one ten thousandth um, of an inch, so therefore that's one thou, two thou, three thou, four thou, five thou. So, on zero there, I'm pulling on the spindle, pushing at the front, I'll push this out the way and rock it. So we're getting four tenths, a solid four tenths I'd call that. So it's, it's actually not that bad, I, I would like to see that just reduced a little bit. Of course you, you, you do um, want a little, if I could halve that it would be great. So let's um, just check our spindle run out at this stage. Okay, so we're looking at about, well, we're under a tenth. That's pretty bloody good, that. So, yeah, that's, that's spot on. Um, specification for this model machine is um, 0 0.01 millimetres measured there, which is, yeah, three tenths nearly four tenths so we're, we're well under um, the specifications so I'm really happy with that
and that's with standard garden variety ordinary old Timken taper roller bearings. They're not graded spindle bearings at all. Okay so we'll pop the cap off the end and we'll have a look um, to see how our rollers are, are running. Okay, so we have oil there, that's good. So what I'm looking for to make sure all of these rollers are rotating. which they are, everything's looking good. Okay, so in view of that uh, four tenths uh, end flow that we're getting when we measured the front, what I'm going to do is just give this nut a, a tiniest nip up. So let me just clean this, I'll wipe it and mark it with a texture. Okay, we're slacking off our Allen key adjusters. So I've got a, yeah, I think you can see that, yeah, the texture mark on the nut and on the spindle for reference. Okay, our Allen keys are loose, so we're just going to give this a very small tap around. hasn't moved. Okay, that's moved. Re nip. So we'll, we'll re check that with the indicator at the front. So you should be able to see there the small amount that we moved the nut. That is, um, yeah, just a, a bit over the width of the texture, little sharpie marker. Okay, after that um, last adjustment, we've got a, a good rock solid reading on there now. Just, and yeah, the needle is touching. So, can't complain about that. Okay, we've got a bare minimum axial, axial end play there. That's less than a tenth. That's good. That's a really good result. Well, I think everything went quite well going back together. We are able to hold um, a reasonable tolerance for these um, ordinary garden variety bearings. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, that's all that came out of this machine. Um, we're well below the, the factory specification for the run out on the nose of this machine, which was 0.01 millimetres. So we're, we're underneath. We're less than a tenth. So, no, I'm very happy with that. Um, I did get asked a couple of questions, you know, about the, the price of the bearings and that. I'll dig the paperwork out and we'll 
they weren't expensive at all. So I'll dig the paperwork out and we'll go and swing it out and have a quick look at that. So that's all the bearings that we changed. These two little 6202 bearings, um, they're about $7.90 I think they were. They're out of the change gears. This is two 6203s. They're out of one of the counter, or they're out of the, yeah, one of the counter shafts. No, sorry, those ones are out of the drive to the um, change, um, quick change gearbox. Oh no, they're um, 6203, $6.50 each. And the four 6204s, $7.50 each. So that's the input drive shaft and counter shaft. So not expensive at all. The headstock bearings were replaced with plain Jane ordinary Timkins as garden variety plain Jane bearings came out of it, not specialised graded headstock bearings. And they were the uh, da, 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 30212, which is that one there, the front spindle bearing, $33, and the rear spindle bearing. Uh, 30211, $28. So, you know, the bearings are cheap, so there you have it. Yeah, so as you can see, they're not, not expensive at all to do. So, anyway, cheers, thanks for watching, and we shall catch you in the next video. I'm not sure what we're going to be, we may continue on, I think, with our LA Rochelau uh, grinding fixture. I, I need to get that done. It's, I've got to get all the the tool and cutter grinder um, up, running, functioning um, because I, I plan to, um, there's a few modifications that I want to do to that that involves um, getting some um, super abrasive wheels, CBN and diamond and looking at the possibility of permanently mounting them on um, different hubs so I'll have to make up hubs and all sorts of carry on as well so yeah we have a lot to do on that grinder to get it where I want it to be so anyway, cheers Thanks for watching and yeah, like I said, hopefully catch you in the next video.